I closed the door, taking one last look at my sleeping nine-year-old daughter, Annie. My wife, Sarah, was in the small kitchen making morning coffee. Brad, don't forget that you need to take Annie to the doctor's today, and we need to do laundry. I nodded, sneaking behind Sarah into the kitchen of our tiny apartment and kissing her neck. Okay, Sarah, I'll try to quickly get back and forth to the clinic this morning. How about I just take all your clothes and hit delete? Sarah laughed and reached out to squeeze my groin, replying sarcastically, I love it when you talk about laundry. It makes me so hot. Don't start a conversation about rearranging kitchen cabinets or I'll make you my little pinky toe and slam you into the table. Now I laughed and kissed her graceful back. Will you go to work by bus? Damn it, he's always late. Sarah shrugged her shoulders without turning around. James is very understanding. He knows the buses in this city suck. I just hope the starter on the car lasts until payday. James is James Madison, my wife Sarah's boss at Madison Industries, a small family business that Sarah worked for after a temporary job in high school. I started putting on my jacket. What? They didn't give you an advance? Sarah shook her head. No. The HR department said that I had already exhausted everything, and I didn't want to ask James again to press them. Come on, Sarah. James has known you since you started as an envelope sorter. I am sure that this time you will be able to persuade him to show you leniency. Sarah shook her head. This was before James succeeded his father. You know James is trying to keep his cool. He really does follow the rules. Kind of like Moses coming down with the Ten Commandments in one hand and the company's standard operating procedures in the other. She took a sip of coffee. Hell, I typed half the rules while working there during the summer when I was in the 11th grade of high school. So James installed a dot matrix printer for this project. I shook my head. Standard procedures are written by people and on paper and not carved in stone by the Almighty on a mountaintop. Sarah suppressed a laugh. It's just that James is a big nerd, okay? Today I'll ask him again. Sarah, he's been after you since you were in high school. Just wear something provocative. It will make all the blood drain from his brain. Sarah spanked me. Oh, shut up. James isn't that bad. He's just not himself trying to run a company. Besides, he's already bent the rules to help us. I don't care about his retreat. Sarah grimaced as she pushed me towards the door. Go to the clinic and come back as soon as possible. I'll get Anne up, fed and clothed, before you get back. Nodding, I looked out the window of our cramped apartment at the moment of dawn. The sky was blood red and reminded me of an old sailor saying, The sky is red in the evening. A sailor has nothing to fear. The sky is red in the morning. It's not a sailor's taste. Opening the door to go out, I looked at my watch and sighed. Today was Thursday. Five days remained until I died. Walking in the light breeze of dawn, I pulled my jacket tighter around me as I stopped at a red light and thought about an article that stated that most people and relationships can only experience three life-changing events in a given period of time. My three events rolled in like waves on the shore. First, I lost my job. It was a job that I enjoyed and was good at. My bosses and colleagues were wonderful, and the company was profitable. However, if for any reason you stop going to work, one way or another you will be fired. Secondly, the loss of our family home. It wasn't the nicest house in the world, but Sarah and I renovated it and put a lot of sweat into the house. Sarah truly made this house her home, and it was her pride and joy, with a large backyard and a separate bedroom for our daughter Anne. But if you don't pay the mortgage for several months, and even worse, if you don't pay off the loan secured by the property, it becomes the property of the bank. Foreclosure and repossession follows soon after, regardless of whether the mortgage money was needed elsewhere. I could deal with the first two waves, but there was number three, the biggest. Our precious daughter Anne was diagnosed with a terminal illness. Worse, it was not one of those common childhood illnesses for which there was at least hope of treatment. No, our daughter Anne had one of the rare diseases. I won't go into detail, but basically what this meant was that the disease was not common enough for drug companies to do any research into curing or maintaining the condition 
due to the low profitability. It was a miracle that Anne was diagnosed correctly. It was a coincidence that her pediatrician spoke at a medical conference with a little-known researcher from another country. It was difficult to find specialists and make appointments. So it is clear where all my time was going, what was previously spent on work. The insurance didn't cover specialist services or what the regulator considered experimental drugs, which was pretty much everything. So that's where all the mortgage money went. Now there was no money, our bank accounts were empty, and we hadn't even paid the rent. The only thing that was of any value was the life insurance sponsored by my old company of a decent size, and even that was expiring at the end of the month. Like George Bailey in the classic film, It's a Wonderful Life, I was more dead than alive. The beeping and flashing green traffic light sign, Go, jolted me out of my thoughts as I looked both ways before crossing the busy intersection dubbed the most dangerous intersection in the state by our local media. It is here that in five days I will accept death and receive money for my family. My destination was a nondescript shopping center with Asian takeout, a martial arts school, and a convenience store. Swinging open the door with the faded sign lit LW Research, I walked to the front desk with a sliding window and picked up a notepad attached to the wall. The frosted glass sliding window opened, and an elderly lady in a white robe handed me a cup of coffee. Good morning, Brad. She looked at the list in front of her. Are you here for a clinical trial on hair growth and erectile drug or toenail fungus? I didn't look up until I finished filling out the form. Over the past few weeks, I have been signing up to test various medications. It was a way to make money quickly and give me the time I needed to care for my daughter. I'm here about my toenails, I said, handing her the completed form. Last visit. Marge looked at the form, drinking the last of her coffee. Okay, just want to make sure we didn't mix up your medications and that you didn't grow hair on your reproductive organs. Smiling, I asked. How soon will we receive the money? Margie shook her heed. This is not your first race. The check will be sent to you in ten working days. She looked at the form. For this you will receive a huge sum. Marge flipped the page on the clipboard. Would you like to take a sea sickness test at the end of the month? You'll have to spend a week at sea on a boat, but it costs about $5,000. I shook my head. Thank you, but no, I can't be away from my daughter. I wasn't going to mention that I'll be dead by then. Marge winced. Sorry, I forgot about your child. Anne, right? How is she? I shrugged. Without changes. Today I will take her to another specialist. We still have hope, but... I trailed off. Marge caught me off guard by reaching through the window and rubbing my face with her fingers. Listen, Brad, I was a Navy nurse aboard the USS Asylum, the best damn hospital ship that ever sailed on any ocean. Now listen, you dumbass. Get your head out of your ass. Because let me tell you, I've seen shit healed that rivaled. Jesus, rising from the dead. So, you need to keep the faith and never give up on your little girl. Hey, Marge, calm down. Don't you know that swearing is not attractive? Well, aren't you as useful as a white pencil? Fuck you. Marge lowered her finger. I hope your wife doesn't act like your sorry ass. I shook my head. No, Sarah is the best mother. She wished she could stay home to be with Anne, but even though my job paid better, she had better insurance coverage, no matter how lame it was. That's why she's the breadwinner, and I'm Mr. Mom. Marge frowned at her coffee cup before throwing it in the trash. Brad, you both need to keep a united front. Your daughter is looking at you. Keep the faith. A good father will do anything for his daughter. I took a deep breath. Marge, I'm ready to die for my daughter. It was Sunday evening. Sarah was caring for her daughter, and I was walking into our apartment, having just finished a job as a mover, which was paid in cash. There was a traffic light in front of me, and I was standing at an intersection where my life would end in less than 24 hours. It was a pretty stupid plan. This was a place where heavy trucks roared off the interstate, and the blind turn prevented most of them from seeing the intersection and the traffic light in time to stop if they were going over the speed limit. Accidents were common, and the state, 
city, and county squabble over the issue. One television investigation found a memo that claimed it was cheaper to pay insurance claims to fix the problem than to incur construction costs. After some digging on the internet, I learned that my death would result in a death benefit. The amount would be determined according to the life expectancy table and then applied to the state budget. The plan was simple. Get to this intersection during the morning rush hour when it seems like every third truck passes the stoplight and time it so that the light will clear for me to step in front of the speeding 36-ton vehicle. The installed traffic cameras, so convenient and beloved by the city for handing out fines, will record my right-of-way and the passing truck flying through the red light, and all this will be instantaneous. I had been monitoring traffic patterns at this intersection for two weeks and hoped that people's interest in a terminally ill child who had lost his father to government bureaucracy would be picked up by the local media and lead to a quicker resolution of the conflict. As the light turned green and the walk sign told me it was safe to cross, I looked both ways thoughtfully before stepping onto the sidewalk. A strange thought occurred to me. I wonder what I should eat for the last time. Opening the door to our apartment, after much mental debate, I decided to have fruity oatmeal rings and orange juice with wheat toast as my last dinner. Not because that's what I wanted, but because that's all we had in our house. Sarah sat on our shabby sofa in her coat. She offered her cheek to me as I leaned down to kiss her on the lips. Are you going somewhere, dear? I asked. Sarah fiddled nervously with her purse. Brad, there's no easy way to say this. I'm divorcing you and taking Anne. It took me a few seconds to process the words, she said as if someone had knocked all the air out of my lungs after being hit with a baseball bat, I stumbled backwards and fell heavily onto one of our worn-out kitchen chairs. Sarah took a deep breath before continuing. There are divorce papers on the table with the name of the attorney. I am not asking for any alimony, not even for child support. I have full custody of Anne, but you can visit us anytime you want. Now, my brain was working, and I jumped out of my chair and ran into Anne's room. It was empty. There was only an empty bed in it. I returned and stood in front of Sarah. So you take the sick child away from her father, but I can visit my daughter as much as I want. What the hell is wrong with you? Sarah looked at her purse again. Listen, it will be better for all of us. I'm not trying to hurt you. I laughed. Are you trying to hurt me? I know you're not trying to hurt me. In fact, you don't think about me at all. She ignored me and stood up. The overdue rent has been paid, and another three months have been paid in advance. Sarah pointed to the box on the table. There's a new starter for the car. I re-registered it in your name. There is also an envelope with $500 in cash for utility bills. What's the matter, Sarah? You couldn't force your cheap-ass boyfriend to shell out 20 pieces of silver for this betrayal. Sarah shuddered. Let's leave James aside. He has nothing to do with this decision. So you and my kidnapped daughter won't stay at James's house? Sarah turned away. I'll stay. She raised her hand. But this is not a kidnapping. Anne thinks she is on vacation. I had to move away before I hit Sarah. Well, then it's okay. Because when your child is taken from you, as long as the kidnapper has a nice van and good candy, everything is okay. I headed for the door, but Sarah grabbed my sleeve. She's not with James right now, Brad. If you go there, you will simply be arrested. It took maximum self-control not to strangle her. I looked at her with hatred. She let go of my hand and stepped back. Sarah, never threaten a person who has nothing to lose. The next day I had to take three buses and walk two miles to the legal clinic. Even though I arrived early in the morning before it opened, it wasn't until late afternoon that some excited kid who looked like he was still in high school ushered me into a corner of the office and quickly scanned my divorce papers. What is the problem, he said, stuffing the forms back into the folder. Your wife pays for everything. No alimony, no child support, no tie to current or future income. Liberal visitation for said child will be determined, and you will be able to take the child away for up to two months each summer. Most guys would die for a divorce deal like this. I was stunned by his attitude. Yes, and I would kill for the Nobel Peace Prize. But that's not the point. My wife kidnapped my daughter from me. 
The boy leaned forward and put his hand on my knee. I don't have children, so I'm not going to pretend that I understand how you feel, but the courts are not treating this as kidnapping. Your wife does not prevent you from seeing your child. He tapped the folder I was holding. You can fight this if you have the time and money, but the law firm that did the paperwork is a fairly large organization with a lot of connections, so it was funded by someone with significant means. He leaned back. Talk to your wife. If she has any soul, you can use your guilt to get a better deal than any court will give you, because frankly, a snowball has a better chance in hell than you do in court. I raised my hands. Good chances me and God on the one hand against the establishment and everything else on the other. The lawyer shrugged. It seems to me that Napoleon said, God is on the side of the big battalions, and you will be on your own. Three days later, I was standing in my wife's boss's house, or to put it bluntly, my ex-wife's house. James opened the door. Um, Brad, Sarah isn't here. I kept my facial expression and tone of voice neutral. I'm not interested in the whore. She's your problem. I'm here because of my daughter. James looked panicked. Um, well, I don't know. Um, how about we bring Anne to your place later? I looked past him into the house. Don't try to be cunning. I know my daughter is here. Please tell Anne that her father is here. Truth be told, I sublet my apartment to someone through Craigslist for cash, and he lived in his car. It may not have been practical at the moment, but if I had stayed there, I would have considered it to be selling my daughter on a three-month lease. James continued to look around. Well, I don't know what Sarah will say. I'm not interested in the whore. She's your problem. I'm only here because of my daughter. I pushed the door wider behind him, but did not enter the house, but shouted, Anne, Anne, this is Dad. Come out. A moment later, my screaming daughter ran out and jumped it into my arms. Dad, where have you been? Jay's mom and Dad say you're on a business trip, and I'll have to stay here. Before answering, I took a moment to savor the joy of holding my baby. Papa Jay? I looked at James before turning back to my daughter. They said so, didn't they? Listen, get in the car and fasten your seatbelt. Anne slipped out of my arms and rushed to the car. As I turned to watch her run away, I felt James grab my shoulder. Um, Brad, I'm not sure Sarah would approve. I mean, how do I know you're going to get her back? His grip was weak. Some only tapped on the keyboard. I covered his hand with mine and said neutrally, I told you twice that I don't care about the whore. She's your problem. I pressed his hand. And you don't know if I'm going to bring her back. I started squeezing his hand. What did my daughter name you? His face began to lose color. Papa Jay. James tried to remove his hand. Sarah and I thought it would be less confusing for Anne. Increasing the pressure on his hand, I tried to control my anger. Listen, Papa Jay, this won't happen. You are Mr. Jay to my daughter. Not Dad, not Uncle, not anyone else other than Miss Dar. Please tell me what you understand. James's face lost most of its color as he croaked. But what if Sarah doesn't agree? I smiled thinly and hissed. I don't care about the slut again. She's your problem. The only thing keeping you alive is my daughter. She will die, and so will you. Beads of sweat appeared on James's forehead. It's not fair. We both know she's in critical condition. I could feel the skinny bones in his hands as I applied maximum pressure. I don't care. You stole the crown you put on yourself. My daughter Anne is dying. You are dying. A man who has nothing to lose has nothing to lose. I let go of his hand and he pulled away, retreating to the doorway and holding his sore paw. He spat. You're bluffing, I said, waving my hand and walking off the porch. Addition to the poker rules. 44. Magnum hits four aces. That evening I returned to bring Anne. As I pulled into the driveway, Sarah ran out the door. The relief on her face when Anne stepped out of my car was obvious. My daughter Anne had bags from various stores in her hands when she rushed to Sarah. Mom, Dad, and I had a great time. Look at everything we bout. Sarah smiled and spoke to my daughter. Anne, this is great. Why don't you go inside? Papa Jay, um, Mr. James, put your dinner in the microwave. 
Anne shook her head. Dad and I ate Dairy Queen cream cake, hot dogs, and ice cream. Sarah sighed. Okay, then go put the things in your room and show them to me when I talk to your father. Anne looked at me and I pointed to the door. Come on, Anne. I'll call you on the phone tonight. Anne kissed me and ran up the stairs to the front door. Sarah waited until Anne had disappeared and then turned her fury on me. Where the hell have you been? I was in a panic, you know. Damn it. My daughter has a disease. Wow, I said, interrupting Sarah. My daughter has the same disease. -y. I pulled out a small package from my pocket. Here are all her test sticks. Everything is normal. Or have you forgotten that I've been Anne's primary care provider for the last five months? Sarah lost steam and ran her hand through her hair. James didn't know where you went or when you would return. I had nightmares that you were taking Anne to Mexico. I feigned shock. I... Will I change my words? No. I am proud that I am not a liar, but a man who keeps his word. Sarah's eyes flashed with anger. Did you threaten James? He is seeking a restraining order. I shrugged. I didn't threaten. I only promised. And I'm a man of my word. The restraining order ensures James's death. Sarah looked at me intently. This area is heavily patrolled. A police car can be here in less than ten minutes. I shrugged again. A police car and ten minutes against a bullet. Forty-four caliber at a speed of 435 meters per second. What will you bet on? She pulled back. Why are you doing it? I mimed my way through an imaginary list. Well, Sarah, I'm checking my sales receipts and I didn't buy any of your bullshit. The slightest harm to us and you will never see your daughter. I shrugged again. Sarah, if you get a restraining order, I still won't see her. Do you expect to corner a man and are surprised when he resists? Sarah looked shocked. You won't do something like that to the mother of your child? I shook my head. I will try to make sure this is on your tombstone if you separate me from my daughter. Sarah looked at her hands. Brad, can't we just get through this? I laughed. How can I? Every time I go outside, everything I see reminds me of you. Rotting garbage in trash cans, dog shit on the sidewalk, stinking dead animals on the road. She wrapped her arms around herself. Can't you just forgive and forget about it? I'm not Jesus, and I don't have Alzheimer's. Now I know you're self-absorbed and as full of crap as used diapers. But do you want to discuss whether visits will benefit our daughter or not? Because if it's not about Anne, then we won't talk about anything else. I needed a job and a place to live. And quickly, Marge, the old nurse at the research center, answered both questions. My boyfriend owns his own company and always needs help, Marge said, lighting one cigarette from the smoldering butt of another. You have a boyfriend? Marge gave me a dissatisfied look. What? Don't you think that old woman can still rock a headboard? We lived together and had sex for over 15 years. Do you live together in sin? I teased her. What would your mother say? Marge laughed. You can ask her. My mother is 98 years old and has been living with her boyfriend in Century Village for the last 10 years. She threw the old cigarette butt into the trash can. My man is a former chief petty officer in the Navy. His company works on tankers, cruise ships, oil rigs, and all sorts of large offshore drilling rigs when they are in dry dock. Cleaning non-sewage and fecal water tanks is a shitty job. Hot, with 14-hour days for 10 to 12 days straight. The pay is good with all the benefits, but you have to live on board the ship for the duration of the job, and most of the time you have no air conditioning, bad food, no running water, and sleeping with a bunch of smelly men. Most guys don't last 24 hours. I shrugged. So, no expenses on the spot? I asked. Marge nodded. Damn it, Marge. How soon can I start? Marge pulled out her phone. Let me call him right now. He has two ships at the shipyard in Bahama for the Royal Viking Cruise Line in a few days. I know he's missing two guys. I clapped my hands. Great. Now I just need to find a place to live. 
Marge waved her hand. I think I can help you here, too. We have a small studio above the garage, fully furnished. The last tenant moved out about six months ago. Want? It's yours. Just let me print out the lease. I nodded. Marge, until now I've been as lucky as the bald man who won the comb. So, thank you. Marge wasn't kidding about the crappy job. This was the worst job I have ever done. The protective gear and mask were uncomfortable, the long hours of work, poor food, lack of constant running water and cramped sleeping conditions were almost unbearable. I would have quit a dozen times every day, but the pay was good, and Marge's boyfriend, a former chief sergeant, knew how to run a crew and get the best out of his men. Most of the workers were from outside the United States, but they all shared a love of football, or soccer, as the game is known to me. Damn guys of different nationalities, instead of sleeping, spend their limited hours watching damn sports games, or arguing about one player's pass percentage relative to another, and their country's chances at the holy grail of the World Cup. I tried, but I was never interested in sports. If I wanted to watch guys run around a field for 19 minutes without opening a score, I could just watch my colleagues in bars as they tried to pick up girls. Of course, I didn't get along much better with the ladies than they did. They say the best boxers abstain from sex before a match. If this was true, I was on my way to becoming the greatest boxer in history. However, the time off between jobs allowed me to spend entire weekends with my daughter Anne. This summer I saved every penny for our two months together. I had big plans and clarified my schedule and also consulted with Anne's doctors to make sure that nothing we did would affect her condition and that there would be medical facilities nearby. Then the note appeared. I loaded up the car and drove to the house of my ex-wife and Creep James to begin our adventure with my daughter Anne. On Christmas Eve, I was more excited than a child. When I saw the envelope, this excitement turned into fear. To Daddy was written in cursive by my daughter and taped to the screen door. Dear Dad, guess where I'm going? To a completely different country. Isn't this cool? Mom and Mr. J said we would spend the entire summer traveling all over the continent and see a ton of different countries. How amazing that would be. We fly in the front of the plane where all the snobs sit and eat delicious food and as much ice cream as they want. And there's a big TV with tons of movies. It's a pity that you work. It would be great if you were with me. I love Anne. I looked at the hearts above each eye in the letter as my vision dimmed and my anger grew and I felt the artery in my temple pulsate. I let out a stream of curses that would have made my boss proud as I carefully placed my daughter's letter back into the envelope with trembling hands. As expected, phone calls to Anne, Sarah, and even James' phones went straight to voicemail. In desperation, I dialed the last number. Madison Industries, where can I direct your call? I'm trying to contact the owner of the company, James. This concerns my daughter, Anne. I'm really sorry, but James went on vacation abroad and can't be reached. Oh, wait. Are you Sarah's ex-husband? We all just love Anne when she comes here. Such a sweet girl. You must be so excited about her trip abroad. What a wonderful experience for her and her mother. Yes. If I were even happier, I would shit in my hands and clap my hands. I'm sorry? Forget about it, I said, massaging my forehead. Is there a way to contact them? It is very important. I'm afraid not, the administrator answered. But I can take a message. Oh, wait. I have a copy of the document for you in case you call. Do you want me to fax it to you? Where I live, we don't have faxes. Is it true? And where do you live? Nowadays, and here in this century, stone tablets and papyrus scrolls are also in short supply. The secretary laughed. Is it true? but all legal documents can only be sent by fax or delivered by courier. Do you want me to send you documents? Does it depend on whether the courier uses modern transport or a pony express with pigeons? I found myself sitting in a law office again, but this time I was a paying client of an attorney who actually practiced family law. She was an ex-Navy lawyer whom Marge knew, and by her tone and demeanor, she was not some young child but an experienced woman accustomed to giving commands and having them carried out. Sorry, Brad, but it's okay, she said, 
putting the papers back on the table in front of me. As the custodial parent, your wife has the right to request a change in visitation arrangements. These documents here, she tapped the documents, represent a change request for this summer trip. You had five business days to respond, or by default you agreed to the terms and conditions stated. Bullshit, I spat. Last week, I was deep in a sewage tank on a ship at the Mobile, Alabama shipyard. I only returned two days ago and haven't even been to the post office yet to pick up the packages. Wanting to calm down, I continued. That bitch knew I called my daughter Anne every damn night before she went to bed. The mean ex never said a word about this trip. The lawyer waved her hand. I take it that you and your wife are not best friends? I shook my head. We pretend to be nice to each other when my daughter is around, and at least I have never scolded Sarah in front of my daughter. It's not Anne's fault that her mother is a lying, cheating creature. Anne is a little girl with a medical condition and doesn't need stress at all. However, right now, if I were in a room with Bin Laden, Sarah, and Hitler, and I had a gun with only two bullets, I would shoot my wife twice. The lawyer laughed. Well, there's not much we can do. I can take legal action, but your daughter's first-class pleasure trip around the world is unlikely to be condemned by a family court. She raised her hand to remove the objection. Yes, yes, I know that you were not informed, but the court will consider this an honest mistake. In the worst-case scenario, your wife will be scolded and warned to speak directly and more clearly. On the bright side... This incident is recorded, and if something like this ever happens again, we will be in a better position. If you want to start, I'll need a fee. Sure, I said, pulling out my credit card as an idea formed in my head. Late that same day, I retrieved the key from a hiding place in Sarah and James's backyard. I mentally thanked Anna for the information about the key location and reminded myself that children have no privacy filters. As I walked into the dark house, I remembered a wide shot of the house from the company's summer and Christmas parties that James's parents had thrown when they were alive and running the company. I walked silently up the stairs and found a guest toilet with only a sink and toilet. Kneeling down, my flashlight illuminated the pipe leading to the toilet cistern. The old pipe was as rusty as I had hoped, and a simple tug caused a break with a slow but steady flow of water. Turning off the flashlight, I quickly left the house. Justice may be blind, but time in court and billable attorney hours never come cheap. I had spent most of the funds I had planned to use for my vacation with Anne, and my boss already had a full team. So I went back to Marge to see if she had any leads. Marge blew a stream of smoke into the ceiling. Brad, one of the guys needs help setting up and dismantling the fair for four days. He pays $200 a day, but you have to pay back $50 a day to the team boss. Sign me up, Marge, I said, and that's how I found myself in line at the food and drink stand, trying unsuccessfully not to look at the beautiful spandex-clad buttocks of the girl standing in front of me. She was wearing some risque Asian schoolgirl outfit and was typing on her smartphone. Ahead of us stood a large guy dressed in what looked like a poor imitation of the Jolly Green Giant from the frozen vegetable boxes in my freezer. Hello, Justine, the guy called out, addressing the girl in front of me. Don't you want to listen to a joke? Oh, wait, you can't. It's so long. A group of costumed guys laughed along with him. The girl didn't even look up from her phone. Well, Rick, I could tell you a joke, too, but it would never get to you. The group ahead of us laughed, and even the Jolly Green Giant joined in before answering. Wow, Justine, you are one badass bitch. Justine was still typing on the phone. I've been called much worse, Rick, just like your girlfriend. If the green guy was offended, he didn't show it. Pointing to the menu above the kiosk window, he said, Listen, small fish tacos remind me of you, Justine. Justine looked up from her phone and looked at the kiosk menu. It's a pity that they don't have young carrots. It could be clearer to you. She pointed to the picture. But they have pizza, and if they serve it in two minutes, it will be like dating you. The Green Giant's group howled with laughter, and he turned away from the window with his tray, smiling. Nice talking to you, Justine. 
I better leave before someone drops the house on you. Justine just waved her hand at him. Don't forget to get a straw, Rick, because you suck. Rick waved back as he left with his group. As I was about to return to examining her tight ass, the girl turned and addressed me. Why do all the guys think that the meaning of life is their husband's household? I clasped my hands. Maybe because life is short and so is their junk. She laughed. Very good. Looking at my badge around my neck, jeans and t-shirt from the local animal rescue service, she asked, Who are you wearing? I picked up my badge. Um, the person at work? I set up kiosks and help with the conference room. She nodded. Man at work, I like it. My name is Justine, and I am a character from the manga Hinako. Justine twirled to show off her outfit. What do you think? I nodded. You're cool, and you look exactly like her. By the way, I'm Brad. Justine looked at me questioningly. You have no idea who Hinako is, do you? I shook my heed. I wouldn't recognize Hinako even if I hit her with my car in the parking lot. Justine laughed and turned to order her food. Having received the tray, Justine pointed to an empty table. Brad, I'm interested in you. Please sit with me when you get your food. I sat down opposite her and asked, What happened between the jolly green guy and you? She rolled her eyes. Rick, we dated for a while, nothing serious. He's too much of a man-child for anyone but himself. We're still on good terms. Justine then waved her hand around the crowd as they passed by. So you're not into all this? Don't you know anything about anime, manga, or Comic-Con? I studied her outfit. No, not really. But I'm guessing your character is a high school girl who leaves home to make it on her own, partly because of her evil stepfather, and meets a group of like-minded people. She treats animals better than people, right? Justine put down her fork. I thought you said you didn't know anything about Hinako. Pulling the paperback from my back pocket, I held it up so she could see the title. Since the Greek stage plays, little has changed. There weren't so many plots. The evil stepfather is a common theme in everything from Shakespeare to Star Wars. Justine took the book from my hands and read the title out loud. Classic Tales of Ancient Greece. She looked at me. A man who loves to read has a sense of humor, works, and loves animals. You certainly tick all the boxes. Justine handed back the paperback and pointed to the faint spot around my ring finger. Also, you're not married, which leads to the question, why are you single? What's ringing in your armor? Your kryptonite? You'll have to ask my ex-wife. I'm sure she can give you a chapter and verse of my mistakes, I said, picking up the paperback. I read old books, legends, and myths testimonies of time, heroes, and everything else, from Midas, with his gold, to Hercules with his gifts, but I certainly don't see myself on this list. I pointed to some characters in the crowd. Take Spider-Man's composure and Batman's with his fists. Even Superman unfurls his suit before taking off. I raised my hands. I'm pretty sure I'm not the right person for this. Justine leaned back in her chair tapping the straw against her teeth before speaking. It all depends on the circumstances. Where do you want to go? How much do you want to risk? She took a sip from her glass. I'm not looking for someone with superhuman gifts or a superhero myth and some kind of fairy tale bliss. Justine put down the glass. I just need someone I can turn to, someone I can kiss. She gestured to a man passing by with a small child on his shoulder and a lady next to him, all in suits. I want something like that. Justine pulled out a pen and wrote the number on the napkin. I think you can date a girl who likes to dress in fun outfits. I chuckled and dialed her number into my phone. Well, if we go out together, all my friends will help you make fun of me. Justine picked up her glass again. My alter ego is an elementary school teacher, so I have the whole summer off. Where are you going to take me first? If you're ready to unleash your inner child, I have a real adventure for you. Most of the activities I booked for my interrupted holiday with Anne were non-refundable, 
and Justine played the part perfectly at events such as fairy tale Princess of the Day, and even wore a cowboy hat for pony rides. After our third date at Chuck E. Cheese, Justine dragged me into her bedroom for the rest of my vacation. While I entertained Justine during the day, the night was mine. There were no barriers, and Justine not only wanted, but also initiated everything, from any kind of sex to role-playing. Virgin, slut, schoolgirl, or bad girl, Justine took on the role faster than I could take her clothes off. It wasn't a one-way street as Justine told me what she wanted and where her buttons were. After Justine had woken me up with her caresses, I expressed how much I enjoyed spending time with her both in and out of the bedroom. Justine ran her hand over my chest. Brad, my job is to make you happy, and you have the same job as me. There are two of us while we are together. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I am not some doorknob that anyone can turn. Only you and I can do that. If this is not in your wheelhouse, please let me go. I stroked her hair. Justine, if you love someone, give him freedom. And if he comes back because no one needs him, then let him go again. However, don't worry. I won't let you go anywhere. I had a great few weeks, but every day I was texting, emailing, and leaving phone messages for Anne, Sarah, and even that idiot James. I never heard back, except for a single message at the end of the summer from Sarah telling me when they would be back. When I pulled into their driveway, there was no one there except a bunch of construction trucks and a pile of damp, moldy trash on the front lawn. I tried unsuccessfully to hide my laughter by calling Sarah's phone, where I left one more message before leaving and returning home. My lawyer was right. The court did not take any action on my original complaint. It was listed in the file as misunderstanding to be resolved. So I was surprised when my lawyer called on Friday. Your wife and child have returned. They are at the Charter Arms Hotel. In the lobby, you can see city police officers and social workers, and I'm already here. I got there in record time. Anne opened the hotel door and jumped into my arms. Dad, I missed you so much. We had so much fun. She was talking a mile a minute as Sarah walked up to the door. To say that Sarah was surprised to see a crowd at her door would be an understatement. Brad, what are you doing here? Who are all these people? My lawyer handed her a stack of documents. This is the consent of the court, allowing Anne's father to make changes to visitation. Since you have not responded to the change request within the five business days required by our state, the change is permitted. Sarah was stunned. What? Wait, what are you talking about? Our house was badly damaged due to water leakage. We have been doing everything in a hurry since we returned from abroad. You can't take my daughter. The exhausted social services representative looked irritated. Ma'am, the court looks critically at people who ignore their orders. You have been duly notified. Sarah looked desperate, though I didn't see the notification. I looked past Annie, who was still hugging me and talking about the mountains she had seen. Jesus, Sarah, there must be a misunderstanding, I said. Jameis, Sarah shouted, and James instantly appeared at the door. They're taking Anne. James pulled out his cell phone. Everyone just stay where you are. I'm calling my lawyer. The social services representative looked at her watch and discovered that it was already five in the evening. The end of work, like any good government employee. Sir, you can call anyone, but the court is now closed and Monday is a holiday, so any appeals will have to wait until Tuesday if you want your daughter to come back and stay here. About staying in this hotel, my lawyer chimed in opening a folder full of newspapers and handing them to the social services representative Sarah, James, and me. This slum where they keep the poor child is a danger to his health. A recent report shows the hotel as one of the worst in terms of sanitation, safety, and rodent infestation. He's one step away from closing. James clasped his hands. There is a big convention in the city. Everything is booked. We'll have something better next week. Sarah looked at James with fire in her eyes before shoving the newspaper into James' hands and running back to the hotel room. Sarah returned instantly with a duffel bag, which she thrust into my hands. Get my daughter out of here now, she hissed, but then her face softened. Please, Brad, take Anne away from this place. That weekend, 
was one of the best weekends of my life. Anne and Justine had hit it off in an instant and were together, eating pizza and watching terribly snotty movies, combing each other's hair like it was an adult slumber party. It was a great weekend with my two favorite girls. Then things got strange. I was expecting a big legal battle with Sarah over Anne and knew my arsenal was limited. When my lawyer called on Tuesday, I was ready for a fight to the death. Brad, your wife requests that you retain full custody and care of Anne until their permanent residence becomes habitable again. I heard her rustling papers. It should happen in three or four months or so. She is only asking for liberal visitation based on your agreement and custody will be discussed in the future. Wow, I exclaimed. Are you some kind of witch with magical powers? She laughed over the phone. Actually, I'm a little upset. Over the weekend, I worked on arguing based on your history as a primary care physician and caregiver with the fact that there was a retired military veteran in the home who was a registered nurse. Even your friend who is a teacher was a plus. Add the fact that you can work from home and I thought I had a win-win. Now I laughed. Yeah, my retired chief petty officer runs around like some tough, grumpy character from the Hollywood casting department. But underneath, he's a big old gentleman and made me handle the logistics and planning for him. Pays a little less, but no more travel, and I can work from home. Okay, Brad, it looks like the big salary that I expected for the hours spent won't happen. Hell, your ex even refuted the best argument I never had to use, about possible mold in their house. They are going to submit the house for mold inspection by reporting this to the testing company you have chosen. Crap. I don't know what to say. Well, don't say a damn thing. Just pay my bill when it comes. Then things got even weirder. Justine picked up and dropped off Anne during her visits to Sarah because, well, because I don't have the middle fingers to express how I feel about my ex-wife. And suddenly they were fucking best friends. It all started when Justine would stay with Anne and Sarah for a while during her visits. Then the three of them would go out for a treat before Justine brought Anne home. Soon the three of them went shopping, to beauty salons, and to the cinema. Like the three damned musketeers, Anne was immensely happy, but being friends with Justine and Sarah was like watching a lamb and a hyena sleep together, you know how it goes. Since you see this on animal TV shows all the time, you just never thought it could happen in your home, and you didn't think it was a good idea. Finally, I couldn't resist and asked Justine about it. Justine, what the hell is this crap? You and Sarah are best friends. What, Brad? Do you think she'll bite me? Turn me into a lesbian lover? No, he won't bite, but rather, he'll stick the knife in the back. Leopards do not change their spots. Are you jealous, Brad? Justine said with a sly grin. You can come with us tomorrow if you want. We go to this new gym with boxing training. Of course, Justine, I'd like to see you and Anne punch Sarah in the face. This is the wrong gym, Brad. Damn, too bad, because I would pay to see this. I stopped for a moment. Okay, Justine, we can all meet at Blockbuster Video. A look of confusion appeared on Justine's face. Blockbuster Video is not even funny. That's exactly Justine. She laughed. Remember when I told you that my job is to make you happy? Yes. Well, Brad, Anne is happy. Does this make you happy? Of course, seeing my daughter happy makes me happy, I replied. Justine smiled slyly again. So, if my friendship with your ex-wife makes your daughter Anne happy, and that makes you happy, then what's the problem? Justine, you don't understand. Justine put her finger to my lips. Brad, if I don't see Sarah again and that makes you happy... I'll leave her in a heartbeat. But this will only make Anne unhappy, which in turn will make you unhappy. Do you want this? I felt like Justine was fighting a battle of wits, and I was an unarmed opponent, so I did what every guy does when he's outmatched. I silently awarded the victory to myself, swore, and left the room. A year later, Justine and I moved in together, and Anne began calling Justine Mommy Jay. Justine, Sarah, and Anne continued to play the Three Musketeers, but until I became D'Artagnan, it was good. However, I would be lying if I said I was still comfortable. But they were there, 
you can't spill them with water. Anne, my precious daughter, miraculously went into remission, and that was the most important thing of all. In the end, I asked Justine to marry me, and although I would have been happy if everything had been organized at the mayor's office, Justine still preferred the historical place that was booked a year in advance. So I had to endure endless conversations about desserts, napkin colors, and God knows what, for months on end. Six weeks before the wedding, Justine sat at the table, looking over the guest list for the nth time. Anne was in the bedroom, watching TV. Brad, what would you think about inviting Sarah and James? I think about them when I dip cookies in milk, you know, hold them under water until the bubbles stop. Justine laughed. Come on, Brad. Anne will be the maid of honor. Surely your love for me will overcome your dislike for them. Justine, I love you so much that if we were on a sinking ship and there was only one life jacket left, I will miss you so much. Justine threw a pencil at me as Anne entered the room. Dad, Mommy Jay, when are we going to eat? Justine looked at her watch. Damn it, I'm so sorry, Anne. I lost track of time. I pulled the tattered menu out of the kitchen drawer. Don't worry, let's order Asian food from the place where Marge works. Yeah, I want scrambled eggs, Anne screamed. I pulled out my credit card, grabbed my cell phone, and pointed at Justine. I'll order and you'll go. Justine frowned as she took the car keys, but blew me a kiss as she walked out the door. An hour later, Justine still had not returned with the food. Dad, I'm hungry, Anne whined. I pulled out my phone and dialed Justine's number. I'm sure Jay's mom just met a former student and is chatting with her now. I'll let her know that you passed out from hunger. There was a knock on the front door, and we heard Justine's phone ring faintly on the other side of the door. I laughed as I approached the door. You see, Jay's mom must have lost her keys and can't open the door. As I opened it, ready to make a sarcastic remark, I was stopped by a blank-faced city police officer standing on my doorstep. In his hand, he held a bloody plastic bag with Justine's ringing mobile phone. In an evil karmic twist worthy of any Greek tragedy, Justine is hit at the most dangerous intersection in the state by a truck running a red light. This was the same place where I was going to end my life, what seemed like a million years ago. The fact that I chose the restaurant that night and sent Justine on a journey that led to her death almost made me commit suicide out of guilt. Thank God for Marge and the chief. They took care of all the funerals, because I was a walking zombie, barely able to function. I moved back to the little apartment above the garage because everything in the house I bought with Justine reminded me of her and the role I played in her death. The day after the funeral, Marg showed the understanding and compassion that Navy nurses are known for. Brad, get your heat out of your ass. To say I was surprised when Margie burst into the apartment, throwing open all the curtains to let in the midday sun while ripping the sheets off my sleeping body would be an understatement. What the fuck, Marge? Can't you see that I am in mourning? Marge pulled up a chair and sat down in front of me. The morning is over. It's time to join the living. I tried to pull the sheet up. Leave me alone. I'm not some kind of Superman. You can't even imagine how bad I feel. Marge didn't let go of the sheets. Sucks. Then I'll buy you the cape that Superman wears and you can be super crushed. Look, Brad, Justine is gone and there's nothing you can do about it. But your daughter is alive and hasn't stopped crying since the funeral. Do something about it. Your daughter has lost someone she considered a second mother. The best way to overcome your pain is to help someone else overcome it. Misery may love company, but no one loves people who are mired in misery. Marge let go of the sheet to light a cigarette. The best way to honor Justine's memory is to show your daughter how to cope with loss. Marge pointed at my unshaven face and rumpled clothes. Is this really the example you want Anne to follow after this tragedy? I sat up in bed and rubbed my face. Marge, if only I knew where to start. Marge handed me the list. This is a group of grief counselors. Choose one and tell him you are from me. Don't forget to take Anne with you. Marge looked around for a place to shake off the cigarette ash. And run to the shower. Otherwise you stink like a goat. Marge, as usual, 
was right in seeing that the grief counselors allowed Anne to cope with the loss of Mama J. And although it took me longer, I was able to not be afraid to get up every morning. I sold the house and moved into Marge's little apartment above the garage. My needs were few and far between, and I was told that since Justine and I had no legal agreement, and because our state did not recognize cohabitation common law arrangements, I could not expect anything from the accident. So you can imagine my surprise when, a year later, three checks arrived in the mail from insurance companies representing the county, state, and trucking company. The amounts added up to the lottery winnings, but the lingering guilt I felt over my contribution to Justine's death made me hesitant to accept the unexpected help. Marge and the boss didn't hesitate and literally dragged me to the bank to deposit money into my account and sign documents in front of a notary. I saved money for College Anne and established a scholarship for local university teachers. I had kept my distance from Sarah and hadn't heard from her for about a year after Justine's funeral, so I was concerned when I saw her number on my phone. Satan was displayed on the screen, and it was hard to go wrong with Darth Vader's music. Brad, this is Sarah. I'm at Memorial Hospital. You need to come get Anne. My heart rate a doublet. Anne is okay. Why are you at Memorial Hospital? Annie is fine, Brad. James just passed away. Is James dead? There was a pause before Sarah spoke. He had colon cancer. Treatment failed. I know I'm going to hell, but that asshole James ending up with ass cancer was too karmic. I guess God really has a sense of humor. I retracted my comments and simply responded. Okay, I'll pick up Anne at the north entrance. James was cremated and his ashes were scattered over the lake. I thought his last wish was to turn himself into a real ashtray when I answered the knock on the door. A small Asian woman in a medical gown handed me an envelope and hurried away before I could say anything. Confused, I opened the envelope and pulled out several papers. Brad, I hope that you will read this to the end and that your hatred of me will prevent you from throwing this letter away, since I took great pains to print it and deliver it to you. The priest had left, and according to the nurses I heard in the hall, I didn't have much time left. We all have regrets. But my biggest regret is that I will die a thief. Not just any thief, but an evil thief who used a mother's desperate love for her only sick child to commit his crime. Yes, I'm worse than any cartoon villain because I plan my robbery worse than any bandit. But karma is a bitch. And now I know it's true that he who spreads the shit will end up eating it with spoons. It's no secret that I've always wanted Sarah. I was obsessed with her the first day she started working in high school. While I was just a few years into high school myself, this was more than just a stunning blow to a college student. My random encounters and manipulations became so obvious that both my father and mother talked to me about it. While my father ran the company, my mother was the head of human resources, and words like stalking, unwanted advances, and sexual harassment animated the conversation. Unfortunately, this didn't change my obsession and I doubt I'll be joining them at the pearly gates anytime soon. I have soberly thought about everything I have done so far, but with my life measured in days and hours, I can see the cold truth. And I will reveal only one fact. I used the child's illness to get what I wanted and to satisfy my desire to take your wife Sarah as my wife. I'm ashamed to admit I was happy when I heard about your daughter's illness. I saw not a child's pain, but only a chance to take your wife, Sarah, for myself. Our company's insurance policy has been renewed. I hired a health insurance researcher to find all the available options and used that opportunity to select a plan with limited coverage for the treatment your sick child needed, Annie. I was the one who used my contacts at your bank to put foreclosure on your home at the top of the list, hoping to drive your family into financial ruin. I didn't think it would take this long, but you were a strong opponent and found an unorthodox way to get money to pay for treatment. I underestimated a father's love for his daughter and Sarah's devotion to you. I was impatient and could not understand how Sarah could still stay with you, despite my hints about the benefits that a relationship with me could bring to her daughter. Of course, in the end, a mother's love for her only child won out, as I expected. Still, 
I was surprised by Sarah's sudden decision to divorce you and stay with me. Another truth of karma. Be careful what you wish for. Because while Sarah was with me physically, she was never with me spiritually or mentally. Did you know she had a phone with a recorder on it, and she used it to call your voicemail just to hear your voice? After each of your visits, Sarah interrogated Anne, as if debriefing. The strange relationship she had with your fiancé was like she was living her life with you. Who do you think paid the law firm to get compensation when your fiancé died? Sarah would even wait outside places you frequented just to see you walk out the door. How do I know this? Like some kind of stalker, I know the obsession of the other and the lengths to which he is willing to go. My fair lady had her own fairy man. Also, to put your mind at ease, Sarah never had sex with me before you separated. Even while waiting for the divorce, and even kissed me only after we got married. Physically, we did everything that a man and a woman can do. I say this simply as a statement of fact and not to gloat, because although Sarah never refused my advances, she never initiated them, not once, ever. Did Sarah enjoy sex with me? Who knows? My only experience before her was with a paid escort. This was not the scenario of married life that I imagined when thinking about our relationship. But does a thief have the right to complain about the quality of what he stole? With my last breath I give you a gift, the gift of life to your daughter. The trip abroad was not a vacation, although little Anne thought it was, but it was a trip to a research clinic and an experimental treatment. This experimental treatment, not yet approved for humans, was facilitated by a generous donation to the research center when I sold my family business to a venture capital firm. I wish I could say it was because I loved your daughter Annie like my own, but I can't lie anymore. Of course I loved Annie, but I was willing to give up everything I had just to have a fraction of the love Sarah had for you. Sarah ignored my advice to involve you in this decision. I felt that you needed to know this, since the results of the treatment were successful in only one-third of the cases, and in another third, resulted in death. However, from the very beginning of our relationship, Sarah made it clear that all decisions regarding Anne's well-being were none of my business. Finally, in a cruel karmic twist, I myself now have no means for specialized treatment, not covered by my chosen insurance plan, that could prolong my life. So I end with questions you should ask yourself. Parents always say that they will give up everything for their children. Can you accept that your wife left you for your daughter? Can you agree that your wife leaving you costs your daughter's life? Will you be able to forgive and continue your life with your wife? Hate me if you want, but your daughter is only alive because of the sacrifice your wife made. James Madison. I almost crashed into a moving company van you haul, when my car screeched to a stop in front of Sarah's house. On the lawn, the top sticking out of the pillar was the sign for sale, with the conspicuous addition, bank property. Without even stopping to knock, I burst through the door to find Sarah in a tattered sweatshirt, surrounded by cardboard boxes. Brad, Sarah exclaimed, and ran her hand through her hair. What are you doing here? I handed her the letter. What the hell is this? Sarah's face went through a range of emotions as I paced back and forth across the room, trying to release the anger-fueled energy. Finally, Sarah placed the paper on a pile of cardboard boxes. James wasn't a bad person. Bullshit! I spat, picking up the letter. James was a scumbag. Even himself he knew it. May he burn in hell. I took a step towards Sarah. This is true? I asked, shaking the letter in front of her face. Sarah did not back down and stood her ground. You need answers. It was a statement, not a question. I think I have the right, I shot in response. You want answers? Sarah said again, turning her volume up. I almost shouted, I want the truth. Sarah looked me straight in the face. You can't handle the truth. I threw up my hands and turned around. This is not a scene from the movie Good People. You are not Jack Nicholson and I am definitely not Tom Cruise. Just answer the damn question. Okay, Brad, 
she said in a quiet voice before screaming. I should have kept you from suicide. Sarah's statement felt like a physical blow and I recoiled, her words taking the wind out of my sails. What? What are you talking about? I stammered. A sad expression appeared on her face before she took the box off her chair and sat down. Come on, Brad. You didn't marry a fool. I could always read you like a book. Besides, you were always careless on the computer, never clearing your browsing history or internet searches. Shit, I muttered, leaning against the wall. Sarah twirled the handkerchief in her hands. I am not Sherlock Holmes, and if I could figure out what you were going to do, how long would it take an experienced investigator to uncover the same information and come to the same conclusion? She looked at her hands. I was desperate. I couldn't lose both you and Anne. Why didn't you just tell me that? I asked. Would that have changed what you were going to do? Asked Sarah. When I didn't answer, she continued. I thought so, Brad. She stood up and began to walk around the room. This was an impossible situation. If you follow through with your actions, I will lose you. Insurance will not pay any money. My daughter will lose her father. And I will lose both my husband and daughter. Sarah turned to face me. Even if by some miracle your death brought in some money, you know from your own online estimates that it wouldn't be enough to cure Anne. All your death would have done was deprive Anne of her father when she needed him most, and I would still be left without you. Sarah, you could have told me. We could work something out. She shook her head. I couldn't let you live with a decision that I knew had to be made. It was all on me, and I was going to bear the brunt. That's not how marriage works, Sarah. We must be a team. She shook her head again. Someone alone had to make a decision for the team. You were going to give your life for the good of your family. My version was less radical. I still couldn't wrap my head around this whole new tidal wave of information. What about the experimental treatment that could have killed our daughter? Don't you think that I, as a father, should have a say in deciding my daughter's fate? Sarah heard the anger in my voice, but did not hide behind any excuses. We both saw our daughter die a little every day. It was only a matter of time, and time was running out. I turned away. Brad, you know that Anne was suffering. Did you want this to continue? I had to be involved, I shouted back. Sarah shook her head. I've already caused you enough pain, and I couldn't hurt you anymore. This was a chance to heal our daughter again. Or kill, I interrupted. She shook her head again. A drowning man clutches at straws. As a mother, I needed my daughter's pain to end, one way or another. Sarah reached out to touch me before speaking again, but I backed away. Brad, I did everything as if we were a family, even though we were no longer a family in the truest sense of the word. I never stopped loving you. She wiped a tear from her eyes. So many times it hurt so much to be away from you that I just wanted to crawl onto your porch, curl up in a ball, and die. Well, Sarah, if you ever feel like it again, make sure it's Tuesday, because that's the day I take out the trash. I saw how she suppressed her laughter. If all your longing for me is true, why didn't you leave James and come back to me after Anne recovered? Sarah bit her lip before answering. Don't think I didn't think about it. But I made my bed and now I had to sleep in it with James. I was in a prison that I built for myself. Of course, it was a good prison with a decent warden, but still, not the place where I wanted to be. Besides, I doubt you would have taken me back, and by then, you had Justine. I can't tell you how jealous I was of her. But when I saw how happy she made you and Anne, I just wanted to be a part of it. A quarter loaf of bread is better than nothing for a starving person. I looked around the room, all the boxes. I needed a break from this conversation. What are these boxes? Are you moving? Sarah just waved her hand towards the room. The bank now owns the house. They even bought the cars. I was only able to finance a used Camry so I could drive. We are moving to an apartment complex near Anne's school. It's a nice place. Anne will still have her own room. She laughed. There is really no pool, so next summer Anne will have to dig it. Sarah's face became serious. I know I've put a lot on you, but if there's a chance that you, me, and Anne could... I turned away, 
almost running to the door. Sarah, I have to go. I'll talk to you later. The next three days, I knocked on Sarah's apartment door. It had been a long three days, all the while deep in thought, which Marge said was unfamiliar territory for me. Did I have feelings for Sarah? Will our life together be better for Anne? Now I had money and a job with all the benefits. Can I forgive and move on? Was there anything to forgive and where to move? Although I know that Sarah believed that she always acted in desperate circumstances and in everyone's best interests, I couldn't shake the fear that if we moved in together, I might wake up one day without a kidney because Sarah would decide she could make better use of it. I asked Marge and the boss for their opinions. Chief said, stop drifting and either sail away or drop anchor. Marge was more eloquent. Finally become a man. And if, damn it, you can't take a shit, don't torture your ass. The opening door brought me back to reality. Sarah was wearing a long sweater, and I could see the pile of boxes and chaos that has been the bane of every move since the days of the caveman. Brad, would you like to come in? Anne will be ready in a minute. Of course, Sarah, but first we need to talk. I took a deep breath as I walked through the doorway, remembering the French philosopher's phrase, you can find your destiny by choosing the road to avoid it. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.